This is the Global Broadcasting Service, serving remote outposts since 1928. Hi, everyone. Welcome aboard the Walt Disney World Express Monorail. Caramba, we have something really big for you today. Welcome, foolish mortals. Now then, hang on to them hats and glasses, because this here's the wildest ride in the wilderness. This is the DBC Pod with Phil Schoen and Jason Dodge. everyone, welcome to this week's pod. This is a show for the week of November 14th, 2022. This week, we discuss changes we'd like to see in the Galactic Star Cruiser. Top three holiday treats we are looking forward to trying in our va- upcoming vacation. And our takes on pre-arrival and pre-vacation rituals. Of course, the DBC engagement this week was how many days is too many in, uh, in a single park on a per-vacation. So it's a little bit of a tricky question, but um, we got, we got, I think I got some predictable results. We'll talk about that towards the end of the show. But first, for here's what's going on in our Disney World. Phil, take it away. Yeah. So uh, the first topic, I'm kind of combining a few things because it's one of those things that isn't super fun to talk about. But at no. the same time, it's what everybody was talking about. So I would feel a little disingenuous if we didn't talk about it. But so first of all, uh, Disney had their la- latest quarterly earnings and on the surface, everyone was like, Oh, look at all the money they're making from the parks and stuff like that. But it actually had a lot of earnings misses to based on what wall street was looking for. And since then the stock price has like plunged to a 52 week low. And there's lots of calls from the investment community, from Jim Cramer and others calling for uh, Bob Chapik to be fired um, at the same time or, or shortly thereafter, a note was issued to the staff within Disney from Bob Chapek uh, announcing a targeted hiring freeze and basically evaluating all positions and and cutting off a lot of uh, expenses and basically saying they're going to be looking you know for where cost savings can happen and this will include uh, people being fired basically there's going to be people let go um, so it's kind of an un, you know from a from a corporate standpoint it's a little bit of an uneasy time within you know the the building in Burbank and stuff like that. So I don't know. What are your thoughts on all of this going on, Jason? Um, you know, I'm not an economist, right? I'm not a wall street guy. So like everybody take that with a big giant grain of salt. Right. Um, so on these things, when Disney's a giant company now, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they have streaming ESPN, Hulu, they've got the old Fox. The, the, there's a lot of arms to Disney, right? They're not just like a, a company that makes cartoons and has a couple parks and places. Right. So, um, the parks are doing fantastically, and they're not. I don't think they're doing any hiring freezes that are related to the parks because that's what's making them money at this point. So the reason why I'm saying Disney is a big company with a lot of different engines, a lot of that f- hiring or excuse me, hiring freezes and firing are going to come from those parts of the company yep. that aren't making a lot of money. So um, for those, all we care about here is the movies and the parks, right? That's what we're here to talk about. I don't think we have that's going to affect um, that segment unless maybe there's less investment. In like Disney Plus coming coming down the road, so um, that's something to kind of uh, look to. Um, as far as Chapek getting fired or people calling for his firing, I mean it's Wall Street. It's like you know, I, I was kind of surprised that everybody was like screaming for his firing. I, I should he be fired? I don't know. Would somebody else do anything differently in his shoes? I mean, what real things have has Chapek done that has caused the stop? Other than some buffoonery and some terrible PR statements. Yeah. It, that doesn't affect the integrity of, you know, how many people buy. That was, you know, that was my first reaction too. was like, okay, if somebody else was CEO during this time, mm-hmm. what would they have done drastically differently? That would have had greatly different results, right? If you look at the things that are weighing the company down, a lot of it is from under, well, uh, under Iger, you know, the, the 71 billion they spent on Fox and then also a lot of debt they took out during the pandemic, which, you know, I mean, they kind of had to do just to float right. and have pay, pay their bills and stuff like that. So there is a lot of debt they have to pay. Um, so I just don't know what else another CEO could have done unless it is the PR stuff finally kind of catching up to him that, you know, the fact that, that there's negative takes on him from that standpoint. But Wall Street doesn't with, care about that, like but, unless it impacts business and it hasn't, though. Right. So I don't know if they just thought somebody more, you know, that that got along gave better impressions would help that. I don't know. Um, I don't know so it's, it's an interesting thing. And, you know, at the same time, you know, 
there weren't a lot of options. You know, a lot of the strong options for CEO were leaving the company, which is one reason why Bob Chapek got the job. And are they really cultivating somebody to replace him anyway, or who from the outside could come in? You got to have somebody from the outside come in. I mean, yeah, I I think of the strongest, you know, CEOs have done the best have been the ones that have come in from the outside, fresh perspective, that type of thing. So what kind of CEO is is that? Is it a tech CEO? God, I hope not. (laughs) But is it somebody from the entertainment business? Hopefully, right? Somebody has, you know, some experience there. Yeah. That's and as far as the uh, the jobs and stuff go, I, I did see, you know, when you look through the details, it, it mentions the, the word content a lot where they're talking about those jobs. So I think it's much more related to, like you said, the people producing the movies and, and especially related to the Disney Plus shows. You know, if you look at the details, the, the last quarter, the Disney streaming services lost almost one point five billion dollars. Obviously, it makes sense to kind of say, are there some efficiencies we can gain there? Mm-hmm. Um which obviously is a little troubling. You know, does that mean there's going to be fewer new shows coming to Disney Plus and stuff like that? But you know, I think the the shows that have done well there, they're still going to support and stuff like that. You'll probably just see less of like the secondary shows and stuff like that. So we'll see. I mean, they're obviously going to look at the parks too. Are there areas that they can gain some efficiencies and stuff like that? But you know, they're still trying to hire more you know staff for the restaurants and for the cleaning staff and stuff like that. So that's I'm not going for cast away. Members, like- yeah. So I don't think this is going to drastically impact your park going experience. Um, It just sounds scary. No, for sure. I I think you'll have to be worried about the parks uh, in firings and and, and that sort. When you stop seeing a lot of like the hiring bonuses and all this other type of stuff that you see on some of the postings, like, you know, you work for 60 days and you get like a $2,000 like sign on bonus, that type of stuff. So um, when that's all gone and they're not, you know, hiring at all anymore, then you then you, then you'll you'll see that, but they're they're still they still need people at those parks, and that's that's still their money maker. So they're not getting yep. rid of any of that stuff. So, uh, moving on. Speaking of the parks, a couple uh, smaller items happened that related to the park. So um, there was a mystery at, over at Disneyland about what was going to happen to the Tarzan Treehouse that had been under construction for quite a while. Um, and for those of you who haven't been to Disneyland, um, they had the same treehouse like at Walt Disney World that was a Swiss Family Treehouse. Um, except it was converted to retheme to the Tarzan IP over in Disneyland. And they were going to be retheming it again, but they didn't say what it was going to be. There was some speculation it would be Encanto related. Well, it turns out that it is being rethemed to no IP and it's going back and it's going to be called the Adventureland Treehouse uh, with some, I guess, still in there saying influenced by Walt Disney's Swiss Family Robinson movie and stuff like that. Um, the concept art for it looks pretty darn cool. Um, it just yeah, looks like, like a fun kind of like very like, you know, if somebody had, you know, some if you were like 10 years old and had unlimited funds and built a treehouse, this is probably the treehouse you would build. Um, there is a little a couple nods or at least one in there to the Society of Explorers and Adventurers. So I think there's going to be kind of a, a couple little, you know, Easter eggy things like that in it. But overall, it looks uh, looks a little bit fun. Um, so are you. Did this catch you by surprise that they went to something without IP? You know, everyone's saying, like, when's the last time they took IP out of an attraction, let alone do an attraction that doesn't have IP? Yeah, it's um, – I, I don't know. I mean, I, I like it, right? It's, it's really cool. Does it catch me off guard? No. I mean, this wasn't – this was on my radar, but not really on my radar. Yeah. I mean, it's a Disneyland thing. Um, I wasn't really heavy invested in following this story. I like that they're doing something unique, but that's easy, right? Because it's it's a static attraction, and they can and it's you don't have to do anything. So there's one, there's no expectations, right? So if they're going to do Encanto, are they going to make just like a treehouse type of thing, like a walkthrough, or are they if they ever going to do an Encanto ride? I think they're going to want to do it some justice, right? It's not just mm-hmm. like a simple thing. So I'm not really surprised that it's not um, uh, IP, but um, I don't know. It's it's cool. I like it. I like the drawing. It's um, something I probably won't see for a very long time. I'm not, I don't know when I'm going out to California to see Disney there. Yeah, uh, I feel similarly. I mean, I think and looking thinking about it more, if they did make it in Kanto, it would be more of a draw. And how many people can that you know walk through really handle? And also, I don't think they're changing anything to make it more uh, ADA compliant. So, do you want to have your first in Kanto attraction be something that a lot right. of guests can't do? Um, so I think they kind of like, that's probably another reason why that, look, we're re- refreshing it, but we're not going to make it some huge major draw because it, it sort of is 
one of those attractions that it is what it is, unless we were going to like knock it down or something like that. Mm-hmm. But it's always fun to see, you know, everyone always says, you know, they got everything has to uh, have IP. So it was kind of fun to see something that's not IP driven like that. 100%. And then another small change that was made out at uh, Disneyland, although we are told that the same change is going to be coming to Walt Disney World and Disneyland in Paris as well, is that they've added inclusive dolls to It's a Small World. Um, so the there's a couple of dolls now that you'll see there that are actually in wheelchairs. So I think it's a neat little kind of update just so other people can feel like they're, rep, you know, it's supposed to represent the whole world, right? And kind of show how we're all more mm-hmm. the same than we are different. So now people who are, you know, maybe in wheelchairs or, or just differently abled um, can see themselves like that too and feel part of the uh, part of the whole small world as well. So I thought that's, it's kind of funny. It's one of those things, like once you see it, you're like, wow, why did, why hasn't this been done earlier? Right. Um, but, you know, it's nice to see, and I'm glad it's coming to Walt Disney World and Disneyland Paris as well. Yep. If you check out Blog Mickey where this was, you pulled out this reporting. Yeah. It, it, it looks cool. It looks seamless edition. It, it looks really nice. I, I like, that's, I like that, that always, I, I heard a few people comment about that, about just how well it, like the design of the wheelchairs, like it, fit, it looks like it's always been that way, which is, yep. which is a testament to good design, I think. So. It's important. And that is it for the, the, the news or what we're ca- talking about in our Disney world. And that moves us on to our takes, which this was your idea, Jason. So why don't you uh, <laughs> kick us you off? You say that like this is a bad thing. <laughs> well, I, I will say I struggled a little coming up with uh, some of my I thoughts, did too, so. but I, I think it, it lends itself to um, an interesting discussion. At the very least, um, we're going to do our takes of pre-vacation or pre-arrival activities or rituals. Things that you do before you arrive. Um, or hit your vacation that your family always does or you make sure you do. And we're, we're going to kind of basically say which one's overrated, meaning like you don't re- – like when I say overrated, I mean like you really don't need to do this. Like right. there's, uh, there's some practical things and then there's some some that maybe are just, cr- just there to create memories, that type of thing. Um, I'm going to go with my overrated uh, pre-vacation ritual and it's planning every single step. Right, so this might not be a, a ritual, but it's like an activity. A lot of people like to plan like every single minute, like down to like the fifteen minute mark. Like we're going here, then we're going to go here. Um, taking plan, taking advantage of like the touring plans, like touring thing, where it's 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 literally directing your feet from one attraction to the next. Yeah, um, that's I I think that's a waste of time, and I don't think that it's it's really necessary, especially with the way Genie Plus is at the parks, which you'll soon discover. <laughs> um, you got to be nimble when you're out there. And, and my advice is stop over planning. But if you're going to do any detailed plan, it's just basically think about contingencies in your head. So let's say you go there. What do I do if the park is really busy? Well, we could do X, Y, Z. When do I want to take a break? Let's do this hour or two in the middle of the day. Like plan out those type of things so that when you're at the parks, um, you're making as little decisions as possible. And that, that's how you make your day a lot more stress free, I think. Yeah. I think that makes sense. I think I think it's 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 harder now than it's ever been to find that right balance of doing mm-hmm. enough planning, but not over planning for your takes at, at Disney. Like you said, having to have that contingent contingency plans and stuff like that and just kind of knowing what you do when something goes wrong. But having every like and then then we're going to spend seven minutes at the bathroom and then we're going to go here right. and like like it just. It, it's not going to work out that way. <laughs> well, well, I mean, one, one of the things that I've learned, whether it's my professional life or private life, is the less decisions I have to make like on the fly, the better time I have. That's why I like the dining plan, right? Because it, it took out the decision about where I'm going to eat, what I'm going to eat, and how much money I'm going to spend. It's just like, this is where we're eating. This is where we're going. We made this decision six months ago, you know, three months ago, whatever it might be. And the same goes from a, a lowly person like me to some of the most high-powered CEOs uh, in the world, like they have people like they don't even think about like what they're wearing today, where they're eating, like that's taken done. That's done by assistants and stuff like that. They're freeing up their stress for larger decisions and scale that all the way down <laughs> to somebody <laughs> who's leading a Disney vacation. The less decisions that you have to make uh, just allow you to have a better day. Absolutely. What is your overrated ritual? So my overrated, and it, this was the one that was the hardest for me to pick because I think you know there's a lot of things that maybe I don't do, but if it works for somebody else, then that's that's fine. Mm-hmm. Um, but the one thing that I just don't necessarily get, or something is very different than how we do things, at least, um, is packing early. I know some people who are like leaving in three weeks. Here's my suitcase is already like ready to go and everything Ooh, like that. Yeah. And 
like, I guess there's nothing necessarily wrong with it, but we're always like, well, our, just our moods might change or the weather might change or like, mm-hmm. you know, so we, we usually have like, you know, a, we put together a list of, you know, what we're, we're going to pack and stuff like that, but we don't really pack until the day before. And then we kind of can grab whatever we want. We don't have to worry about like keeping things aside or anything like that. So I don't know the, the idea of getting like so ready to go that you're like all packed up a month ahead of time. If it works for you, great. But that's to me, that's a little overrated. That's going a little too far and doesn't work for us. The only thing I do if, as far as packing early is getting all the ancillary things together, like in a pile somewhere. So it's like all my extra batteries, the things I don't use on the day to day that I yeah. know I'm going to bring. I want to make sure they're on there. And I've also have a checklist and stuff like that. But that's the only thing I kind of gather before we pack. And usually we pack like a day or two before we all end up leaving. So I'm, I'm with you on that one. I think that's a good one. Uh, my properly rated pre-vacation ritual I think this is popularly rated by almost anybody is waiting for your magic bands to arrive. Right. Um, I have, was having this discussion with my mother over the weekend and it's not like it used to be anymore, which is kind of disappointing because now you can order your magic bands. As soon as you, you know, book your vacation, you get them right away because you're spending, you know, none of dollars on them. These aren't free versus when you used to buy, uh, we used to get them for free and they were just the simple colors they would arrive like 30 days before your vacation. So when you got that box with your magic bands on it, it was like a really cool milestone that your vacation is almost here. Um, So in order to get that done, you have to kind of time it now if you kind of want that ritual. But um, that's still kind of one of the last things that I I kind of hold on to is uh, we got ours a little early. So I was uh, was thinking it would have been nice that we're just just inside 30 days. It would have been kind of cool. But I think think that part is, is really fun. Yep. Uh, So my properly rated is I put listening to park music, but anything sort of more park related, it could be, you know, maybe watching some of the the YouTubes of the firework shows or something like that, but kind of like bringing the parks home on a more consistent basis and kind of getting people excited for things. So whether it's, you know, the the ride songs or, or things like that, where it's much more parks focused, we ramp that up as we get closer to our trip just to kind of get us more in the mood. And then when you're on the ride, you're like, Oh yeah, I remember, you know, two weeks ago when we were listening to this and yep. that sort of thing. So we were actually just doing this over the weekend. We were watching uh, tower of terror, you know, ride throughs and they're terrible because you can't see, <laughs> see anything because it's all dark when the rides are going on. But my uh, oldest daughter's like, I can't wait to go on. I want to watch the video. So she's watching different ride videos and stuff like that. They wanted to put on cosmic rewind and uh fantastic. I'm like, Nope, no spoilers. We're going to go in and, you can't watch it on YouTube, but they're probably watching on YouTube on their <laughs> tablets. But um, no, I, I like I like this idea. And listening to park music, we do this every day. So this is not something that we do. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, like get your kids amped up, ready for the vacation. Um, I'm down with that. Um, my underrated pre-vacation ritual is um, that's underrated is putting in a room request at your resort. I don't know if we've talked about this. I think we, we've touched upon this a couple yeah, weeks mm-hmm. ago when we were talking about something. I forget what it was. But where your room is in a resort can make or break your vacation in a lot of different ways. So when I we were rating resorts when I, and I brought up um, Caribbean Beach Resort as underrated, some people absolutely do not like that because they've gotten stuck in bad places on that resort and are forced to like just walk forever to get to the main building for food or walk forever to get the pool or walk all around and go somewhere for the, uh, the Skyliner. If you get your room exactly where you want it, or at least roughly where you want it, it can change the, the outlook on the vacation. You could do this for any resort. It doesn't guarantee that you'll get it, but you can usually send in an email or Touring Plans does it for you automatically if you pay for their, um, their service. And you hope and pray that you get Building 41, and that's right by the Skyliner, and it's you know great for everything. So um, I'd suggest... Um, find out where you really like to stay and put in the request and you might get it. I, I'm usually about like, I think I'm, the well, last time I went, we requested a room on in a, the building, but on the first floor, we ended up getting the building we wanted, but we we're on the second floor. Um, the trip before, then I think, I think we've gotten close to what we wanted every single time. So Disney's actually pretty good about that stuff. So I think that's underrated because I don't think a lot of people know you can do that. And um, it, that's one more fun thing to do, to sit around and um, find pictures from different rooms and see which where you want to sit or be at in the resort. And 
again, I'm gonna I'll I'll prop up touring plans. I don't they don't need me to prop them up, but <laughs> I'll them one more time is they've got all where all the rooms are, where all the room types are, so you can kind of find out um, if you get like a water view or a fifth sleeper where they're located in each property. So it's yeah, it's I think. On there, they also have where you can click on the room and it'll show you the view from that room. Mm-hmm. They don't have like every single room, but you can at least get an idea of like, okay, if I'm halfway down this hallway versus all the way down, here's what my view, you know, I was yep. looking at that a little bit because obviously with being at Animal Kingdom Lodge, you know, where the view of the Savannah is kind of is a big part of it. So, yeah. Um, so my underrated one, and this probably counters your overrated a little bit just because I included the term planning spreadsheet. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, the idea was doing it with, getting family input. Um, I think sometimes it, it's easy for us to get caught in our heads and want to plan out every little detail, but I think it's really fun getting input from your kids and your spouse and, you know, extended family, if you're going with that, like, well, what are your priorities? Like, what's something you want to do? And um, I think that helps them get more invested and feel more ownership of the vacation as well. And kind of just like, oh, well, now we're doing this person's like request and that sort of thing. So um, sometimes I see people that, you know, it's fun too, to surprise the kids and things like that. Like, Oh, Hey, we're going to Disney world today. But I actually find at least with my family, having everyone involved in the planning aspect, uh, is good for everyone and kind of builds that anticipation as well. So we've been doing a lot of that lately as I've been trying to flesh out my spreadsheet a little bit. It's kind of asking everyone's like, well, what are your, you know, what are your one or two rides you definitely want to do? What are the one or two snacks you definitely want to get in stuff like that? So. I think it's a great idea. I try to get my family involved in the planning and no one ever wants to do it. My wife absolutely hates sitting down and planning the, a, a Disney trip with me. I'm like we do the, the best we do is right around our ADR mark. We say like, what kind of dining experiences do we want? And we kind of pick those things. And um, so that's why we pick like the, you know, the crystal palace and the beer guests and that type of thing. That's how we got to that. But I sit down with my daughter. I'm like, all right, let's plan Disney. What do you want to do? She just kind of like, Oh, I don't know. Let's kind of do... like, she knows she's going to, and we're going to end up doing everything. So there's really not <laughs> like, I think she, she, she's big on tower of terror. So that's one thing that we definitely have to do. Um, Cosmic rewind is on all of our minds. And then, um, you know, flight of passage, because the last time my son was at Animal Kingdom, he was like an inch too short for that ride. So, you know, everybody, my daughter just hit 44 inches, my youngest one. So the whole family is going to do that. So it wasn't really sit down, like planning session type of thing. But um, I tried getting them to do that at dinner. And yeah. The kids just want to like throw food. Yeah, it definitely doesn't like, need to be like yes. everyone sitting at their laptops and like everyone's planning things out. But just like the idea of in- including input from other people when you're developing your plan. Mm -hmm. I think that can sometimes be a little bit underrated because it's easy, at least for myself to get so in the weeds of like, here's like the plan I want to like say, it's like, wait, does everybody else actually want to do this? Well, well, here's the thing. If you don't have a planning family where your family just like, my my wife sometimes like to likes to wing things a little bit Mm -hmm. too much in my opinion, but you can burn people out of your Disney vacation a lot earlier. So you got no, know the room, know how to read the room when you bring up your spreadsheet. I mean, that's why I definitely try to leave it like, well, what are the one or two rides you really, because I, I just don't want to get to the end of the trip. And then somebody's like, oh, I really wanted to go on that. I was like, well, you never mentioned that. Like, I didn't know that. Well, especially since you're doing a lot of quick hit trips where like, you know, you're not there for four or five days where you could potentially, if you miss something the day one, you've got day two coming up. Right. I've got only got a single day in Hollywood Studios in a single day in Animal Kingdom. Animal Kingdom, I'm pretty sure we're going to be able to do everything that we wanted. But in Hollywood Studios, um, we might not get everything done. So my, my, again, we could, we could talk about this. I think we're going to do a show update prob- or a vacation update plan planner next week. Did we say that, Phil? That was, that's what we're talking about, yeah. Oh, sounds good. All right, where can they find us on social media? Yeah, so let us know what your uh, underrated or overrated planning uh, rituals are. At Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, or TikTok, all at the DVC pod, or join our Discord server. Um, speaking of which, welcome to our new member on Discord, the Cole H. And also, just a quick update to the, the Disney Comeback Index. Obviously, we had the big update last week with Fantasmic. Um, just a slight uptick now. We are now standing at 92.15 as the Green Army Drum Corps in Toy Story Land is back. So, again, nice to see a little bit more entertainment coming back and um this isn't really in the the dti or anything but i just thought i come out. i've been loving all the entertainment that's been around for the holidays that i'm seeing like posted everywhere whether it's you know motorcades in hollywood studios or whatever and it's um you know it's not just for the party 
like there's a lot of stuff going yep. on for the holidays in the other parks. So it's really great to see all that. That it, It's feeling like kind of normal uh, for this year. So, I mean, it's, I'm getting a little overwhelmed. This is my, <laughs> word. we'll talk about this next week. Is, yeah. And no, I, I understand where you're coming from. Like, I, I want to be able to, I want this vacation to be more of a Christmas vacation, but I don't know what to, I've never been there during Christmas time before. So I don't want to be like so focused on planning a normal Disney world vacation and then completely forget about the cool stuff that's only there at that time of, time of year. Cause you know, Christmas is a, a family favorite as it is with a lot of people. So I want to make sure we get all the treats and see all the decorations and like, not just like, put blinders on to make sure that we get to Peter Pan at rope drop so we can get on it or something else like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's pretty good. So we're going to get to our topic. This is the one that you came up. With. I think this is a good conversation. Uh, we've been hinting at different things that we would want to change. Um, and you brought it up as how, how would you change the galactic star cruiser? Um, but you had a couple stats here that kind of. Yeah. So there's just a lot of reports now that attendance is way down at the Galactic Star Cruiser after being, you know, kind of basically sold out for months. Um, now there's basically wide availability. I think every day that you can in the calendar book out for, there's at least some availability. And recently some cruises have only been about 25% full. They've actually been uh, canceling one of the dinner services. I guess normally there's two times mm -hmm. you can have dinner. They've only been having one. Um, not some of the staff hasn't even been kind of hired to so like, Hey, we don't need you because there's not as many people involved and stuff like that. So, you know, looking back on it, it hasn't really been open that long. Um, and so I guess in your mind is what are your thoughts about this already struggling with capacity? And then what would you do? I, I guess that's the larger question we can go back and forth on is how do we think Disney should change it to make it a little bit more successful or, or is, are they just going to deal with it? And this is, it is what it is. So the only thing I can't look into is how profitable is like how, how much, what, what is their occupancy level to like break even, I guess, or right. Or, or keep it afloat. Like what, at what point um, do you have a run of occupancy where this thing gets shut down? So I, I don't know that, but yeah, uh, I think I'm going to steal your first idea and I'm just going to prompt <laughs> you to kind of talk about it, sure. but like opening it up to day trips, right? being able to have dinner there or, you know, a lunch service while the guests are kind of rendezvousing at, you know, that too, right. You get to go, there's like a two hour window where you can get in there, that type of thing. I, I think that's, that's something that you would do for sure. Yeah. You mentioned that yeah. I think it's just like right now they're doing constant, like two night trips. Right. And I think they just need to cut that back and maybe only do one or two cruises during the week that are these two nights and then mix in, just day trips where you don't have to worry about turning over rooms. You don't have to do anything like that. And you just have people come up and get to do like one or two activities and get to have lunch and get to kind of see it. And it's still not cheap, you know, yeah. but it's not $5,000 for a family, you know? And I think it's not where you're doing that sort of instead of the rest of your Disney trip, if it's just, you're taking one day out or whatever to do that. So I think that's one way to get people that are, cause you know, you, right now to get the people on about, well, they have to, you don't have to be into Star Wars, but it certainly would help. You kind of have to be into this like role playing element of it and you have to have the money to do it. Like it's just kind of a narrow, you know, the people that check all the boxes to do this, it's not that many people. And I think you need to, you know, there are some people that are interested in it, but maybe I, I speak for myself. I don't know if I'd want to do full, two full days of like this immersion and, mm -hmm. and, and then obviously factor in the cost element. So something shorter, I think is a, a way to go to kind of tease people out on it. I think you could definitely offer certain things like, you know, let's say you do, what is it like three cruises a week? It's about, about right. Right. So there's like right. three days. Basically there was the, with the overlap of a day. So let's say three cruises a week. Why don't you go down to like one or two cruises a week? And then that extra time you can either offer um, normal hotel service, right. Where you can go in and book a night there. Mm -hmm. um, without all of the storytelling and whatever, maybe the storytelling is just limited to like the um, dinner or the yeah. bar or something else like that. Right. And everybody's in all the normal uh, hotel staff that you need to run a hotel is in character, but they're not doing all the different shows and stuff like that. And maybe it's the price of a deluxe. 
right? For right. a single night and a single night only. You can't say multiple days. You can say only one night. And then you could do that, like start your vacation with a little bit of flavor of the Galactic Star Cruiser before you're, and they offer services of transferring yeah. your bags to your actual hotel or something else like that, that type of thing. Um, and then opening it up for, you know, a daytime ticket. Like for like uh four like you go in for like four hours. Maybe there's like a, a, a show or, or not a show, but a performance, I guess, for each one of those. And maybe you don't need the whole hotel staff there, so you can kind of decrease the or overhead that way for most part of the day. I don't know. I, I think I think they're gonna have to do something because yeah. like you said, I, I never saw that min- the the demand for a five thousand dollar price tag year round for something else like this. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's something they could do too is go more seasonally with it. Um, I think they also need to switch it up. Right now, they just have the one storyline, right? Or, you know, right. Um, so how many people that we say check all those boxes and then want to do the same thing more than once? I mean, we I know a few people that have done it a couple times or are coming back, but I, I don't know. I think a lot of people, it's kind of a one and done type thing. Um, and you, I mean, at that price tag for sure. I mean, you can see most yeah. people do that. I, I think. <laughs> I think there is a niche, a profitable niche for something like this experience, yeah. right? Or completely immersive. I think they need to find the right balance for maybe you don't need as many actors and quests and things that you need to do. Maybe, you know, you have this hotel, it's an immersive experience. Um, you, all the guests are playing a role, but you don't have all the actors all over the place. It's just still a hotel at that point, yeah. right? And I think you you reduce overhead that way, but um, in, instead of having five thousand dollars for <laughs> for your trip, you're maybe it's like five to six hundred dollars a night, and you know you can stay there for a couple days type of thing, yeah. and then all the fancy stuff happens in you know the fall or the spring or something. Yep, and then obviously, I mean, another direction they could go is is really switch it up and change the time period and have it during you know the original trilogy, where I'm sure there's a lot of Older Star Wars fans that would definitely welcome to do that. We know they wrote a book that Han and Leia took their honeymoon on the Star Cruiser and stuff like that. So it it did exist at that time frame as well. So they could do that. But the only other thing I'll add is I know a lot of people are like, well, I'll never do it. It's not for me, blah, blah, blah. I do think, you know, I, you see some people almost happy that it's starting to maybe fail. And I don't think that's the right attitude. This is something no. where Disney took a chance. And everybody I know who's done it said it was amazing. Like the, they did it super high quality and this is what we want to see more of Disney do. Now it doesn't mean everything we want them to be $5,000 a night or whatever, but we want them to do immersion. We want them to do high quality things. So we want this to be a success so they can learn from it and kind of be willing to try something else that's of the same high quality and immersion and stuff like that. But but just think, okay, so this is, this is very expensive thing to do, but Disney's learning how to keep actors paid on Mm -hmm. staff so let's say the hotel version of this doesn't work out financially but maybe a version of this it it ends up at you know star wars galaxy's edge and it's just part of the park experience and maybe instead of a hotel we could have all these actors that are working there normally and then at night it's it's now this is a party ticket that you could have just at galaxy's edge let's say after eight o'clock at night and you can kind of run around for two hours and kind of explore this type of thing. Is it, yeah. you know, the, I think that might be more palatable to people, you know, like instead of spending $5,000, you're spending like a hundred dollar ticket for like a two hour adventure, at, you know, in Batu as like a normal yeah. guest too. So, I mean, like if this bleeds out to other things, right. It's, it's not like, Oh, um, themed hotels don't work. Let's scrap the whole idea, but you can take parts and put them, put them other places to yep. make, you know, a couple extra bucks. Absolutely. All right, what's next? We've got our top three holiday snacks and drinks uh, on here. See, this this is what's giving me agita about my trip. There's just, <laughs> like, I'm glad these articles came out because I don't think they were available. When were these written? Were they, were the these last written? Uh, week, week and a half. They, the first one that came out was about um, Magic Kingdom. So mm-hmm. had all the special food and snacks that was at Magic Kingdom, either all the time or just for the Christmas party. And then a few days later, they came out with one. This one's pretty recent. They covered all the specialty holiday food at Disney Springs, Hollywood Studios, and Animal Kingdom. So we're, we're still waiting for the food detail at Epcot. 
That, and that's what I'm looking for. I know that's point. the one that I'm really going to be spending some time with. So I thought we cover this first before we get it, before the yeah. Epcot stuff comes out. So this is for the non Epcot things. Uh, the top so three I'll, items that were in these lists are, are just related to the holidays that, that, that are priority for you to try to get done while you're there. Obviously I've never eaten any of these things. So the, these are top three things that have caught my eye, not top three things that taste good <laughs> because I've had them. Uh, so my top three are, I want to get some gingerbread at the grand uh, Floridian. Um, yep. I don't care how it tastes. I'm not a huge gingerbread fan, but my family is. Um, so I'm looking forward to being like, yep, we did this. This is great. Uh, maybe we'll do it again one day, uh, but we'll be there. So we, uh, you kind of have to buy gingerbread and Disney's can't wait to sell me probably what's $20 piece of gingerbread <laughs> or something uh, for the kids. Uh, the second one I caught this caught my eye at Hollywood's um, gosh, where was it? It was uh, the, um, Christmas Old Fashioned, and I think that was at Disney Springs, right? Yes. Yes, at the Boathouse. Yeah. Um, I love a good Old Fashioned. The, the picture was really, not, <laughs> really <laughs> nice and enticing, so I'm like, all right, we got to try that. Um, it will be at Disney Springs our very first night when we get down there. Um, and then my last one is the Red Velvet uh, Whoopie Pie. I'm a big fan of Whoopie Pies, and I'm also a big fan of Red Velvet, and that, that picture looked absolutely phenomenal. And I believe that one was at the – I should have written this down, but I didn't. Oh, I think this is at – oh, yeah, here Someone? we go. It's at the AB, is it the ABC commentary or no, the Backlot Express? Yeah, I think Backlot Express. Yes, Backlot Express. So we're going to check that out on the second day because my plan is basically we're not going to get a whole bunch of – we're going to get a bunch of snacks, but we're going to get big enough so everybody can have a piece. So, so that's where we're going. At. We're going to try a lot of different things. But you can't all. We all have to share. You can't have yeah. one. So that's gonna that's gonna help my uh, my uh, my wallet. I think a little. Yeah, bit. Yeah, and this way you can find out if you you like it or not. Exactly. Right. We'll do <laughs> sampling. Uh, okay. So what are what are your top three holiday snacks? Or so the first one I listed is the, is the drink that caught my eye. It's actually not too dissimilar from your Christmas old fashioned, but this one was called in holiday fashion. Uh, various locations at Hollywood Studios. It has uh, Buffalo Trace. Kentucky straight bourbon, rosemary syrup, cranberry, lime, and cinnamon. So that sounds very holiday-ish. That sounds like something that would be lovely to get before we go into the uh, stadium for watching Fantasmic when we're sitting there when I might get a little chilly at night and have that uh, Mm -hmm. nice little drink for me. Um, Over at Creature Comforts in Animal Kingdom, they have something called the Holiday Moose Dome, which is amaretto chocolate mousse, cherry, cranberry coulis, orange chocolate cake, white chocolate glaçage, and chocolate pieces. So... That sounded tasty right. to me. And then this one, which is the one thing that uh, my kids are excited for this one, too, is that various carts on Main Street in Magic Kingdom, they have their Christmas cookie churro, which is obviously the famous Disney churro, but with marshmallow cream, cookie crumbles, and Christmas sprinkles. So I so definitely he- think we'll be getting some of those. Here's the ironic part, right? Like, I never pay attention to all the vloggers talking about the latest cupcakes and the desserts. And, of course, I'm on YouTube. I'm like, I need some vlogger to go around like <laughs> I know, trying there's all the too many things, at, right? At Disney Springs. Like again, we're gonna talk about this next week, I think. But like again, I want to make this an awesome Christmas vacation. I'm like, okay, where do I start? I was like, and then all of a sudden all this deluge of stuff is and like how do I fit do I do I plan to like, okay, we gotta go to this place, then this place, then this place. I don't wanna do that because now we're gonna have three or four extra steps in my I quote unquote itinerary that I have to plan for and I don't want to do that. Um so what I'm I'm trying to do is absorb everything through osmosis in my body and just be hyper aware that these things are available around me and maybe pick one or two things to kind of target. And then if I if I walk past, let's say I'm at Hollywood Studios and we're at the backlock or near the backlock uh, lot express, I'd be like, oh I remember they have this thing here. Let's go in and try it out and grab it really quick. That's what we'll do. But I have I have severe fear that either I'm going to screw up my vacation because I'm planning too much, which is what we talked about uh, in our uh, yeah. our takes, and then here we go, we're like, you know, losing out on Christmas stuff. So we shall see. How, how are you How are you planning? Are you just picking things at random that look good and say, like, okay, we're just going to go here and get it? Or is this more of like, I, those look good. If I find them, I'll eat them. If not, I'm not. So I think them. it'll be a mixture of that. I think, again, this is why, you know, when I mentioned talking to the family, it's like, okay, we're going to go through these lists. And if there's some, like one or two things that you're like, I really mm-hmm. want to get that, you know, like the kids mentioned the churros and stuff like that, we're, then we'll make sure we get those. 
Otherwise, it might just be something if we pass by, be like, oh, yeah, I remember that one. Like, why do we stop and get that? We got a couple of minutes. Yeah, right. yep. So I think it'll be a little bit of a mixture where we'll, we'll, we'll identify a few key things. But yeah, if, if we just went for everything that looked good, we'd do nothing but eat the whole trip, I think. Oh, so. yeah. <laughs> um, remind me to talk about Disney Springs next week. Uh, I might have solved my problem for right now. I'm just um, <laughs> I'm at a loss. And there's some logistical things there because we're arriving then after a 15 hour car ride oh, right, right. What, what's going on with that anyway um let's go to our dpc engagement of the week i really love this topic um i'm glad we got some good um you know uh, engagement from the community with a lot of their uh, opinions so the question was over the course of a single vacation what is the most days you've spent in a single park given a week how many is too many Right. So let's call it six or seven days in a park if it's like a big mega trip or anything less than, let's say, a five day trip really doesn't count for this because you basically go to one, one, go to each park and then you're calling it a day. So, Phil, what, what is the most you've been in in a single park, in a single vacation? Uh, and then we'll go from there. Yeah. So the most we've done when we've just been doing like one park a day, not park hopping, is right. we've never done a, a, a park more than two days. And usually, usually like when we had like five day tickets. Uh, usually the extra park is Epcot, um, sometimes Magic Kingdom. Those are the two. Um, when we've had park hoppers, we have done obviously more hopping. And so we would go back and forth and we would do a lot of half days, especially at, at, at Epcot. Again, we'd probably wind up there in the evenings for food and stuff like that. So that we could probably do more than, than two days that we could do, you know, stop in for parts of like three or four days at Epcot. So like I, Epcot, I don't know if that really counts if you're doing it yeah. for food because it's kind of like you go into Disney Springs, right? You're not right. going there for park stuff. You're going there for, you know. Yeah, you know, I think. Food. And so I think when I was thinking about which are the parks that you're really kind of going for, for the attractions and bubble, like not just to kind of walk around and wander. I really focus on Magic Kingdom and Hollywood Studios. And for those, I would say two days max. And some days it might only be one. Cause I'm almost like overstimulated in each of those parks where it's kind of like after, you know, if you go like open to close at Hollywood studios, you, you need like a couple of days to recover from that. Almost. Yeah. So it's like to do that, like more than once or twice, I think is too much. So those parks that are really like kind of attraction and just, just so much going on. I think in some ways, you know, for most trips, we're only going to do them one day, but definitely not more than two. So here, here's my opinion. It's, it, th- most people said three. That was a common thread. Um, I've done trips where I've done three Magic Kingdom days. And it, that was our trip in 2019 was 10 days, nine nights. And that was a crazy long trip. And we did like Magic Kingdom the first day, Magic Kingdom in the middle, and Magic Kingdom at the end, uh, the last day we were there. And that was just right. Um, however, when we went back, we went in um, June or excuse me, July. We hopped to Magic Kingdom the four park days. We had a full day at Magic Kingdom, and then we hopped there every night because it was we're like, okay, well, it closes every day at like eleven yeah, o'clock. Yeah, it was later than everything else. Yep. So let's just go. And I have to tell you, going to Magic Kingdom multiple days in a row is not good for <laughs> your sanity. Uh, as much as I love it, it's just like if you if you go to just kind of like chill find a quiet place it might be okay but like to go to actively do like park things it's it gets it gets a little you know nutty with the crowds and stuff like that so i'm down with three uh hollywood studios i'm right with you on that on on that park like that park takes a lot out of you and and you're you'll you'll be best friends with my wife on that one because (laughs) she can't she can't do that park more even hop to that park for an extra couple hours because that because i think it has to do with the layout of that park it's just exhausting to get around it's just not a pleasant walk um around that park animal kingdom i think you can i think two days is the max you can do that that park only because they have some good food around that area and it's kind of a a chill relaxing park so you can always spend your mornings there and hop away i guess uh but yeah i i don't i don't i don't animal see kingdom how. feels like one of the parks where if i was local and you know where we're just doing you know going for a couple hours or whatever i could see myself going to animal kingdom a lot because it seems like a, a very a great place to just wander for a few hours but yeah, it's the on, prettiest a, park. On, a, sure. yeah on a regular vacation you're kind of knocking everything out after like a full day right so mm-hmm. you don't necessarily need to be there too much yeah if i was an annual pass holder animal kingdom would be a like a pr- 
it's it's you can get in and out of it pretty good. I mm-hmm. mean, and uh, there's plenty of places to just kind of sit and relax in that park. That if, that if you don't care about going on a whole bunch of stuff, yeah, you can do some you can do some fun things. Um, going to some comments from the community. Our our good friend Matt, um, he said he he wrote. We actually talked about this in our la- uh, in our episode of Happily Everything Disney. Uh, I think each park merits essentially a full day for a full week trip. But I think the next days come down. I think, but I think the next days come down to what you want to do, what secondary things you want to do. If you want to rope drop something, ride attractions at night. So basically, if you're if you're catching, you want a specific thing, maybe you do an extra park event night. Um, and Doxy also mentions this. For me, it depends on the park. Hollywood Studios, Animal Kingdom, for me, are one day parks. Any more than that is too much. I'd probably be done after three days at Magic Kingdom. Epcot's a little trickier for festivals, et cetera, that type of thing. So I think it's more along the lines yeah. of what you were talking about, like getting all the food and stuff like that. Um, when she went with her AP, she was at, she was there all eight days for food and wine. I think that's kind of <laughs> absolutely insane. It's probably a fun trip, though, too, if yeah. she's actually getting to all the different booths and stuff like that. That's something I would love to do is uh, kind of what my wife and I did was you basically – you're going to the park to just relax, right? There's no like, I need to do this. I need to do this. I need to do this because this is my one trip in two years type of thing. You're just, you can just be. So um, I think we'll have a little bit of that in our trip coming up. If the whole uh, holiday cookies and not getting enough of this <laughs> stress doesn't get in the way. Um, anything more you wanted to add on this engagement topic, Phil? Uh, just maybe that on the community, it did also turn into a little bit about discussing on how many days in a row just in general you can do before needing a rest oh, yeah. day and that's a, good topic. a lot of yeah i mean that's almost like a separate topic but that's you know that that also comes up and a lot of people there were saying again you know kind of two days and then an off day or two days and then an off day if you're going for a full week well we, we got we got a we got a little bit of time before the end of the show so let, let's talk about it um if you are planning a seven day trip a week trip um i like for example i have six tickets right I will not do any park open to close anymore. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, And we enforce a a midday break for a lot of these things. Um, So that being said, can you do like six days in a row at a parks? But if you're not fully at the parks the whole day, does that count as a rest day for you? Or do you need a full day of nothing? Yeah, um, I'm kind of more like that where I either need a full day or like half days or something. Like I don't even know if I could do like rope drop take a bid day break, stay till the evening, like six days in a row, at least somewhere in there, I would need something where like we're sleeping in like, mm-hmm. like, cause, cause once you start getting up to five, six days, it's pretty cheap to add like a seventh day on. So yep. we might do that. Yeah, and then just, yeah. yeah. And then just say we're sleeping in and we'll just go the evening somewhere or something like that, or, or the reverse where we'll, we'll go in the morning and then we're coming back, but we're not going to go that night or something like that, where I, for a full week like that, I would need at least two half days in there. Um, but I don't know if I necessarily need, cause even when we, we have planned and we've planned like an off day where we're not going into a theme park, we always fill it with something else, whether it's Disney yeah. Springs or mini golf or going to see hoop de do or something. They're not like down, down days, you know? So sometimes I find for us, what works better is maybe planning two half days instead of a one full, totally off day. Yeah. I mean, like for our upcoming trip. Uh, our first days at Magic Kingdom, but I don't think we're we're not rope dropping it because we got to check into our hotel. We still have all of our stuff, that type of thing. Our second day is Hollywood Studios. We want to do Fantasmic, so there's going to be a midday break in that one for sure. Mm-hmm. CBR, it'll be easy. Our Epcot day, we're going back in the middle of the day because it's easy to do. That's why I love staying at CBR. It's super easy. Um, then we got a full day Magic Kingdom day, but we're taking the half a day and kind of going and seeing the gingerbread house at the Great Floridian and kind of relax and do those type of things. So, and I, I think our last day there when we do Epcot, we might not, it dep- if we get like Remy's in and stuff like that in our first Epcot day, I think we're just going to sleep in that last day and just kind of mosey over to Epcot and make sure we're there for um, candlelight processional and stuff like that. So it seems, sounds like a lot, but I'm cognizant of like we need to like chill. And one of the saving graces is Animal Kingdom, as of right now, only closes at 7 p.m. Right, you like, almost forced to an early evening there. <laughs> it's an early evening. It's like a free. Day. It's a free night to do whatever you want. I mean, even though it's like right next to the kids' bedtime at that point, but um, you're not you're not staying there super late. So um, we'll see if the strategy works. Where because before this, it was always two days into a park, one full day off, and then. We never go more than two days in a row. But that's back when I was there open to close too. So 
Yeah. We'll see. No stroller this time, Phil. So we'll, we'll see how that affects, you know. How but that's, goes. I mean, that's a good point too. I mean, having, you know, when you're saying scheduling out every minute, if you do that for like every day for seven days, like oh. at some point, one of the kids is going to have like a meltdown or something like yeah. that. And how do you adapt for to sure. that? So yeah, for sure. Building in some of those break times, even if you need to shift it around a little bit. And that's, I guess, one of the things that's causing me anxiety about Genie Plus and stuff like that with not being able to pick your times. It's like, what if our return time is when my kid's having a meltdown and stuff like that? But Oh, my goodness, my friend. <laughs> we are going to have – we're going to be there. I'm going to be checking in on you every, every like, hour. <laughs> are you okay? Are you still sane? Are you still sane? <laughs> um, well, we'll have either a talk on the show as we're prepping for a vacation where we're um, – we can, I can kind of give you the rundown of the G not that you need genie plus tips for me, but like tips for your sanity. Let's put yeah. it that way. Right. Uh, we'll definitely talk about that. That'll be fun. Uh, next week on the DBC, our DBC engagement conversation is going to be around. What is one thing that you have to do every time you're at Walt Disney world? That isn't a food related item or an attraction or a show. So this is something that you, you just, you, it's a certain park bench that you have to sit down on. It's um, I have to stand in this spot in main street and just listen to the music for 20 minutes. The first day I like something like that. That's not something that you can schedule or buy. Well, maybe it is something you can buy, but like, it's not a thing that you can plan for. It's just like, this is what I can do. And I've always done it and I really like it. So I've got a couple, I think we've touched on this before, but it's going to be interesting to see what everybody else in the community has to say for something like this. Cause everybody's got the one little tiny thing that's a tradition. Oh, this is a great topic because whenever I hear some of these things, a lot of them are uh, traditions or have some emotional connection to somebody or right. something like that. So they're always uh, they're always great to hear. So I think this it always is a draws out a really topic. cool story, like yep. how you did it the first time and why do you keep doing it, right? Yep. So uh, I'm looking forward to that. All right, this was the one of our quickest shows in a while. We're at just just north of 50 minutes, which is good. So everybody, thank you for listening and watching. Uh, make sure you like and subscribe and do all the fun things and uh, we'll see you next week everybody take care take care everyone